Welcome to the Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do podcast with your host, Tom Singer. In each episode, we explore the interesting lives of business leaders, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and others who have a healthy dose of the entrepreneurial spirit. It is time to explore something cool. Now, here is your host, Tom Singer. Hey, 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 and welcome to another episode of Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. Thank you so much for pulling your chair up to the cool kids table. Uh, I started this podcast, I mean, we're closing in on five years come, I think it's September. Last day of September was when I launched the show. So we're at four and a half years into this. We are now, this is episode 457. And my goal was to bring interesting people who do cool things in the world of business so that we can all learn from them. Because I believe one thing to be true, and that is success leaves clues. So recently, a name popped up on LinkedIn. Uh, It was somebody who uh, I didn't actually know, but we have some friends in common. He sent me a LinkedIn request, and I usually ignore those from strangers because, you know, it's like a like, a link, a share, or a follow is not actually a friendship. And so if I don't have some connection to somebody or if I don't say, wow, they look like they are pretty cool, I usually ignore a lot of strangers who send me friend requests. However, Tom Gimbel is the uh, general manager of Austin City Limits. Now, a lot of you are if you're not from the area where I am, from Central Texas, you still probably are uh, familiar with what is Austin City Limits. I think it's the longest-running television show ever. Uh, Tom can correct me if I'm wrong with that, but it's a, 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 a PBS show. It runs out of KLRU, which is here in Austin, and it has been broadcasting for, gosh, I think 40 years. So I reached out to Tom, said hello, and asked him if he'd be on the show, and he saw the title of, of the podcast was Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do, and he gave me the greatest response. He goes, I look at Austin City Limits, and he has been the uh, general manager for like eight or nine years. He goes, I look at Austin City Limits as a 40-year-old startup. And I thought, bam, that's somebody who we have to interview. So, Tom Gimbel, welcome to Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. It is good to be here. Thank you, Tom. Hey, I really appreciate uh, you jumping on here. Uh, We only live a few miles apart, but we've never met. So uh, I think after this show is over, we'll have to go have a beer sometime. uh, Yeah, we'll correct that. That's right. We'll correct that and put a face with the name. But uh, give us a little bit of your background. I think it's really interesting. I mean, you have this really cool, I think you told me in the the pre-call, dream job, getting to be the general manager of Austin City Limits. But, But you've had an eclectic background. So let's talk a little bit about what you did before this. Yeah, I mean, I have been in music pretty much my entire life. I think I knew when I was 12 or 13, 14 years old, uh, I knew that I wanted to work in music in some way. And like, like many teenagers, you know, my original goal was to be on the stage, to be a, a, a rock and roll star. And I played guitar and played in bands. And actually, it was a big part of what drew me to Austin. I'm originally from the Philadelphia area, but I, I came to UT uh, University of Texas to go to school, um, largely because of the great music scene here in Austin. What year was that? When did, when did you get here? So that was in that was in 1987. Nice. And shortly before I got here, there were there were really two things that drew me to Austin. If you remember an old MTV show called IRS's The Cutting Edge, <laughs> I think it was a late late night Sunday program, and it was hosted by Peter Zaremba. And they did a show on Austin, Texas. And they had bands like the Reavers, um, who were originally called Zeitgeist, and Joe King Carrasco, some of the people that were happening in the Wild Seed. But an artist named Daniel Johnston kind of stole the show. And I became a Daniel Johnston fan, and I thought Austin was pretty cool. And then the other thing that I would see every week on PBS was Austin City Limits. And I would see the audience at these Austin City Limits tapings. I'm like, man, those people look like they're having a good time. So that that drew me to Austin. I came and visited, and I was hooked. <laughs> and I went to UT, and I interned uh, during college. I, I literally, this is before the internet, so I picked up the phone book, and I wanted to intern for a record label. And the first one I came to was called Amazing Records. And I ended up interning for Amazing, and, and uh, they had a great slogan. If, if it's a hit, it's amazing. Uh, I, I still want to find one of those, those old T-shirts. I wish I had one. But, uh, <laughs> well, you, you know what I think is great? If, if they had been called like uh, uh, Z Records, you would have worked somewhere else if you started in the phone book. It was a good thing they started with A. 
Well, I, I literally, Tom, I went from Arista, or I mean from uh, Amazing, to Antones, to Arista Records. So Arista <laughs> was, was the one uh, in New York where really I, I, you know, earned my chops as, as a music man and uh, got to work with, with Clive Davis and L.A. Reid and some incredible legends in the business. Artists I work with included Carlos Santana and Outkast and Sarah McLaughlin and Whitney wow. Houston and uh, Barry Manilow and on and on. Uh, it was a really incredible experience. And it was a time in the music industry. You know, you look at 1995 to 2005, and it's kind of an up the mountain, down the mountain period in, in the major record business. Um, CDs were coming online, record labels were making a tremendous amount of money from 1995 to 2000. And then Napster hit, and then the digital hit, and the labels consolidated, and, and they couldn't quite grasp digital. They are now. Record labels are making a lot of money now. Spotify and Apple and Amazon and the other streaming services have changed the game, and record labels are... are certainly on, on healthy footing. But at that particular time in the mid 2000s, um, you know, they, they were still trying to figure it out. So I had an opportunity to come back to Austin and I started my own company, a company called high wire music. And we had a distribution deal with universal and we released some records and, um, had some success, but, um, it was a challenging time economically in the music business. Uh, and so I pivoted and started a social media company called Clatterhead. And Clatterhead was a, an early social media company that rewarded uh, recommendations. It rewarded people sharing on uh, uh, Twitter and, and even MySpace uh, back then and through email. Um, and I was doing the, the entrepreneurial things, talking with VCs, trying to raise some money. And I got a phone call. To, to meet with Bill Stotesbury, who is the CEO of KLRU. And after a few conversations, I was um, offered the gig to be the general manager of Austin City Limits, which for me, uh, the city of Austin that I love, working in the music industry and such an incredible brand with such respect and goodwill and legacy as Austin City Limits, it, it was and is uh, a dream gig. And so that's what I do now. I run uh, the Austin City Limits television show on the nonprofit side. And we also have an entrepreneurial arm called ACL Enterprises, which looks to uh, find for-profit opportunities, licensing opportunities, and so on um, for Austin City Limits content. But we are in our 45th season. We are the longest-running music show now in the world. Uh, Top of the Pops in the UK ran for 42 years. And so each year we are uh, uh, increasing our, our <laughs> world record as the, the longest running music show uh, in the world. And, and it I'm is one of the longest, it is one of the longest running shows on television also, isn't it? Just in any genre? I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, maybe Meet the Press or something like that probably has a, a longer uh, tenure, but there are not many shows in, in any field that can last for, for 45 seasons. And a very big part of that is PBS. It's the ability to create something without uh, corporate intervention or, or truly commercial interruptions. You know, there's no commercials on, on PBS, but there's also, you know, no, no corporate overlord saying <laughs> you need to book these type of artists. There's no advertisers that we need to produce a certain rating um, in order to be able to, um, uh, you know, achieve uh, financial success and backing. So so what you're saying is you kind of have the best of both worlds. You get to have this uh, entrepreneurial world and staff and, and goals. And at the same time, PBS kind of allows you a little bit of that flexibility that maybe you're not being crammed down by the, uh, the corporate overlords, as you called it. Exactly. Exactly. PBS really is about uh, the art and in a very pure form. And what we do at Austin City Limits is we bring an artist and an audience together. We turn on the cameras and we get out of the way. It's a very unadorned style of production and shooting. Uh, 
um, it, it moves slower than what you would see on a typical award show like the Grammys or, or MTV back in the day. And so our audience is very loyal because we have an audience of really passionate music fans. And it's a, it's a very cool place to be where you've got this uh, legacy audience that is, that is loyal. And at the same time with new brand extensions like the ACL Festival, which, which is, is which is awesome, list. by the way. I went for my first time this last year, and I don't know why. I'm not a huge music fan, per se, but my wife is, and we both went uh, and just had an awesome time at ACL Fest. Yes, the folks at, at C3 Presents, our, our partners in, in the Austin City Limits Music Festival, are absolutely the best in the business, and there's really not a better experience than uh, going to Zilker Park and, and going to an Austin City Limits taping. It, it is really awesome. So in, in sort of your intro and your background, you said a few things. I want to go back and touch on, on really just a couple of things. Because, number one, you talked about moving to Austin in, in 1987 to go to college. So we're about the same age. I moved here in 1991 after college. Uh, but, boy, has Austin changed. And when you look at the music industry, you know, some of the – Austin's gotten so expensive. It used to be like a great place for a startup band to come from the entrepreneurial side – of music for labels and for bands and for people who are managing. Do you think that the growth and the expense that has come along with that growth to Austin, do you think that has impacted uh, Austin? Is Do you see it like I do as a different city than it was when we both got here? Without a doubt. And, and affordability for our creative class is something that is, is a real issue for Austin. Austin has so many great tech companies, uh, and the, the, the biggest tech, tech companies uh, in the world have at least some placement here, whether it's, it's Google or, or Facebook or, or whoever it might be, certainly Dell. And if you look at the job uh, tabs on, on these company websites, every one of them is going to talk about Austin's vibrant live music scene. <laughs> and the, the, the culture of Austin allows businesses, whether large or small, to attract the best and brightest young talent because they want to live here because Austin is a great place to be. There's now a growing uh, urban downtown living environment. You can walk outside and, and, you know, literally walk to a live music venue. And the talent in Austin is tremendous. It, it, we're spoiled by how great the musicians are here. And literally every night of the week, you can go to any club, on Red River or South Congress or 6th Street or wherever it might be and just see tremendous talent. Um, and so if we don't take care of the creative class that are building the culture that then these, these startups and large businesses uh, use to recruit talent, um, we're, we're really doing Austin a, a disservice. And, a, and it's something that I'm involved with and others in the music community here in Austin are involved with. It's a very tough problem to figure out. And folks from Boston and San Francisco and Seattle, um, you know, can, can speak to this. They're probably a few years ahead of us in, in where affordability is within those cities and, and what it's done to the creative class there. But if you're a, a young musician, um, you know, when I was here in the late 80s, it was easy to be a musician and to rent a house and live downtown and, and you know, go out to eat and have all sorts of uh, good opportunities. I don't know what a, a, a young musician would do right now to be able to live in, in downtown Austin. Well, I've spent some time for the last year in the comedy scene in Austin. The people who listen uh, to the show regularly know I talk about my uh 51 year old toe in the water to doing stand up. And uh, a lot of the young, you know, comics who are really trying to make it and get their start here in Austin, you know, a lot of them, they, they work two jobs. They, they have a job somewhere and then they drive Uber in order to be able to, to get by. And so there's, there's not that same feeling. When I moved here in 91, you know, if, if you wanted to live cheaply, you could live really cheaply in Austin. And I just don't see that anymore. And I wonder if that has a huge impact on, on that entrepreneurial music scene here. I'm sure it does. You know, there are some really good management companies and there's some labels that are, that are starting, but there's not 
the big music infrastructure here like there is in L.A., New York, and Nashville. Austin still trails in terms of industry infrastructure. Uh, where we are a leader is in the, the creative class um, within the live music venues. Um, you can certainly create in Austin, but often you need to go to one of those other cities or at least find management or label representation or publishing representation in some of those other cities. And I think that's something that we in the Austin music community, um, that's, that's a problem that we'd like to solve. We'd like to see more infrastructure come to Austin to support the great talent here. Well, and I, I mean, I see a lot of parallels between uh, music and acting and comedy and sort of the creative class, as you called it, and entrepreneurship. I, I spent a lot of time working around the tech industry in Austin 20 years ago when it was sort of growing up. I, I was a marketing director for a law firm and a bank and a consulting firm that uh, in each of those companies that I worked for, you know, they sold to those tech companies. And that was one of the things that, that mattered in Austin was getting that infrastructure to support entrepreneurship in place. And so I, I think what you talk about is probably very similar for, for the music industry. One other thing you, you touched on in your sort of intro was you talked about the music industry from 1995 to 2005 and, and sort of the, the massive change that went on. If, if we could go back in a time machine, we would say, wow, they were not visionary to where the world was going. I mean, when Napster came in and the streaming and, and things like that, the music industry from, from the outside threw its hands up and stuck its head in its sand and tried to keep everything the same. Like, no, let's just sell, you know, vinyl and CDs and tapes. You know, we don't want to go there. And now they've gone there big time. And like you said, the, the labels are now on really solid footing and they're growing and they're making money. Why do you think the music industry and other industries do this too? I'm not pointing fingers. Why do you think they stuck their head in their sand and said, no, we can't change? Greed. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, it's a, it's a very easy answer. You know, you're, you're talking about decision makers who are making a tremendous amount of money, um, really uh, unfair even to, to other industries. If, if you look at what label presidents were making in the, the, the nineties and, and two thousand, you know, you're talking millions of dollars a year, um, in, in salary plus, plus bonus. Why would you change when you've got that environment because what needed to happen was a complete dismantling of the, the system and the distribution chain um, and, and then to embrace um, a new technology, a digital technology that, um, you know, quite frankly, no one could really figure out. Every major label at that time was trying to develop their own direct-to-consumer digital download play um, and they were trying to charge like three forty nine for <laughs> a digital single download because that's what people were paying for um, a, a cassette or a CD single uh, back in the day. And so the labels just wanted to keep the same economics. It was Steve Jobs and Apple who was the, the Switzerland, you know, was, was the outsider who said, look, I will bring all of your content together because no consumer wants to buy wants to go to the Warner Brothers store to buy a Warner Brothers uh, single or a Columbia store to buy a Columbia single. As labels, that's how we thought. Um, consumers don't think that way. They don't necessarily look at what the label is behind the artist. They just want the art. And it was Steve Jobs who brought everybody together and said, I will create a, a store um, that consumers will actually want to shop because they will have access to everything. Where the big sticking point was, was with the 99 cent price point. Um, <laughs> so greed was really um, a big factor and, and labels did not want to come down off of that 349 or 299 price point. And Steve Jobs insisted that it was 99 cents. And now we look at, you know, it's $9 a month for all you can eat. Right. And that's what it always should have been. Um, and if, if the labels would have embraced that in 2000 and said, look, you know, look at all the barriers to entry and, and all the, the difficult things that you dealt with as a, as a record label. You have to manufacture product. You have to ship it to record stores all around the country. 
it's 100% returnable if it doesn't sell. You have to advertise it to put it on end caps and other places within the retail environment. <laughs> now you have no manufacturing, no return, no co-op advertising. Um, it's, it's a pretty awesome system. You're never out of stock. You know, in the, in the old days, it was such a challenge because what happens if you have a, a new artist and they start getting airplay in Flint, Michigan, you know, and you've got a rush product to be on the store in, in Flint, Michigan, because if you miss that opportunity, it's gone. Now you're available everywhere all the time to every consumer in the world virtually. Um, it's a really unique system, but it also really shifts the paradigm within the record industry. It eliminates retail as a, as a major driver. Um, radio is, is not quite as powerful as it used to be, although it's still very powerful. Um, you know, the, all the infrastructure that a label had to have within their sales and distribution department have largely been eliminated. So it's, it's a unique world. Um, but it required disruption, uh, and it, we just weren't ready for it as, as a record label, uh, or as an industry in the early 2000s. There were people really gripping to, to the way that things had been. And here we are, it's taken, you know, 10, 15 years later for it to finally, uh, find its footing so that the labels are, are now back in a healthy position. But you've got me sitting here smiling like a giant grin from ear to ear because one of the things that I do, so I make my living going into companies and associations. I'm a speaker and a trainer, and I make my, I make my money by teaching people stuff. And one of the things I teach, the big mantra that has bubbled up the last couple of years is try new things. And that's true as an individual, but it's also true as a company. And I think you've just given me sort of a great analogy that I can use because we do get greedy and we do get scared and we stick our head in the sand, but... When they, you know, when your industry tried new things, all of a sudden it changed the paradigm, but everybody was fine and everybody turned out probably better. As you mentioned, all of that, 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 you know, the infrastructure that they didn't have to spend money on the shipping and things like that. And yet we still see people across industry lines who, you know, run from change. And I'm finding in my own life, the more I'm willing to try new stuff, uh, the happier I am, the more money I make, the more you know, fulfillment that I have. And so uh, you just gave me a great analogy that'll probably show up in my next speech next week. So, so I, like <laughs> awesome. I, li I like that. Hey, I've got a couple more questions for you. This is too fascinating. But before I let you go, I got I, I to gotta thank the sponsor of this episode. So this episode is brought to you by Podfly Productions. Podfly takes the time and the headache out of creating your own podcast. They set you up with the right equipment, training, and guidance to ensure that you're going to sound amazing. Podfly does all the heavy lifting and the technical work so that you can focus on creating great content, growing your audience, and interviewing really, really cool people like Tom Gimble. Hey, if you want to start a podcast, and I know that some of you do, jump over to podfly.net slash cool things and check out the offer that they have for the listeners of this show. So, Tom, you've had this sort of eclectic career. You've worked for companies. You've been an entrepreneur. And, and I, I love to interview people. Being an entrepreneur doesn't just mean you own your own business. I think it's having that entrepreneurial spirit. So what advice do you have for somebody who wants to grow a career, whether it's, it's working for someone and growing something from the inside entrepreneurially or starting their own business? What advice do you have for people? Uh, be passionate and and fail quickly. Um, I really, you know, I, I have two kids that are 22 and, and 24 and they're entering the, the, the world. Uh, my daughter, uh, works in the music business, which is something she's, she's passionate about. And I've always encouraged them to be, to be in a career that, that you are passionate about. So whatever you may, uh, love doing, whatever is inside you that you need to bring to the world, um, find a career that allows you to, to be in that space. Because I think it gives you the juice, um, especially if you're entrepreneurial uh, and you're starting your own thing. Um, you can look at the market and you can say, well, there's a need for this particular software, or this particular product. But if you don't love it, uh, 
it, it is challenging. We're all going to go through some, some valleys when we're starting a business or, or running a business. And I think it's the passion and the, the love in what you're doing that allows you to kind of get through some of those valleys and, and, and get back to, to the peak. Yeah, well, I, in terms of- I, I, I agree with that because I will tell you, I've, I've researched, I've, I've surveyed over 500 people and interviewed hundreds of them uh, about what I call the paradox of potential because potential, people get so excited because they've got potential or they hire Becky and, and she checks all the right boxes and they think, oh, she's going to be great. And then a year later, they're transitioning Becky out of the company. Well, potential doesn't equal performance. It's, it's not results. And one of the big things that has come up is it really falls, there's three buckets that come up from all of these really successful people who I've interviewed, and it's it's plans, passion, and people. And the plans is having goals, the people is surrounding yourself with the right, the right people who will encourage and help you, and that middle bucket is passion. And it comes up all the time, and I recently spoke to a group of engineering students at the University of Texas, and I said, look, if, if you went into engineering because someone told you you'd make a lot of money and you hate it, you know, maybe think about changing majors or, or picking up a great minor because you're going to be miserable. And I also, I have a 22 year old daughter who's graduating from college this month and, you know, she's not going to pursue sort of a traditional, she's graduating from one of the top business schools in the country with her undergrad degree in, in business. And she's not going to go to Wall Street. She's not going to go to a big bank, which was what she had intended to do when she picked this expensive private college. Uh, but she wants to follow her dream, and, and I'm supportive of that because the biggest mistake I made was I had my ladder against the wrong wall for 20 years working for other people, and when I asked her why she wasn't going to pursue those big jobs, she said, you say your only regret, Dad, is you didn't start your own business when you were younger. And I was like, damn, you hate it when they throw that stuff back in your face. <laughs> but, but, she's, but she's right, and, and you're right in the fact that if you're passionate about what you do, if you love what you do, it's, it's not only are you going to be happier, but you're going to get more work. I mean, I get hired to speak at companies and, and do like, uh, you know, like a lunch and learn type trainings here in Austin or speak at big conferences around the country. And one of the reasons is people have seen me speak and audience members will come up and go, that was great. But in addition to the content, you love what you do, don't you? And that's why I get booked. So I agree with you. People, people can feel it. You know, when, when you love what you do, you're a better salesperson, you're a better leader, you're better at whatever you do. You know, in terms of, of fail fast, um, it's easy to say, you know, take action. We, we can be all Tony Robbins about it and, and, and take action. I like talking about failing fast because it takes away some of the pressure and anxiety uh, that we feel, which often leads to inaction because we're kind of petrified by, well, what happens if we fail? Um, it's okay to fail. Yep. Um, it's okay to not be perfect. Um, in addition to my work with Austin City Limits, I also have a, a foundation that I'm a co-founder of called the Hi, How Are You Project. And it's a very simple message, which is about saying, hi, how are you to someone, a coworker or, or whoever it might be, and just saying, how are you doing? And it's okay if you're not doing well. It's okay if you have anxiety or you have depression. Conversely, as an entrepreneur, it's okay if you fail. And entrepreneurs have a higher percentage of mental health issues than your average person. And maybe part of it is it because of that drive and that pressure that we put on ourselves as business leaders or entrepreneurs to be perfect or to be successful or to be uh, the next person on the, on the cover of Forbes magazine or whatever goal you might have set for yourself. So by failing fast, it kind of puts you in a mindset of let's go ahead and, and just try. Let's try. Let's see what happens. Let's bring a product to market. Let's write a song and let's play it for an audience. And then let's learn. Let's get the feedback. Let's iterate, let's pivot and see, you know, what we're learning from our action and just being, hey, it's OK to fail. I love that you've gone up on stage and you've you've been a, a stand up comic. <laughs> if you go up on stage the first time, absolutely saying I'm going to be, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, um, you're going to let yourself down. <laughs> if you go up there and say, I'm going to do it because I'm passionate about it 
and I love this. And you know what? I'm going to go up and bomb. I'm, there's going to be Oh, I, bom- I have bombed. Several, I've done 53 sure. open mic nights. I have bombed. Wonderful. And, and I bet there was more learning from the bombing than there was, you know, from, yes. from, the, uh, from the, the nights where you kill. Well, and what, I've oh, learned, and- what I've learned from that experience is I found out that in my life, and this correlates to a lot of people when I go in and, and, and do a presentation, they kind of nod their heads. I've spent a lot of my life choosing to do things that I pretty much knew I'd be good at and stayed away from things that maybe I thought I would suck at, which is why it took me till I was 51 to ever get up at an open mic night and try to do stand-up, considering I wanted to do that as a young 20-something. Uh, never tried it. I wanted to be an actor or a comedian, and I never had the guts to go for it when I was young. And I'll tell you something very interesting. I grew up in Los Angeles, and I never tried And it was all, the whole scene was all right there. I mean, I was literally 15 minutes from Hollywood down the the 134 and the 210 freeway. And I I did not ever give it an attempt. And I look back and I'm I'm sorry for that, that I didn't do it. But it's that getting out there, it's like I say, try new things. It's getting out there and trying it. But like you said, it's not just any actions, it's doing the right actions. But the way you know you're doing the wrong actions is you have to go out and try them and see what the results are. So I have a saying that, you know, your potential is reached through engaging in the right actions, which means you have to pivot all the time. So I think you're I think you're right with your fail fast uh, analogy is that if you're not out there trying and failing, then you're just going to be in this little circle. Like I think I spent much of my life just going round and round with things that you were kind of good at and just remaining kind of good at them. Likewise, you know, I've, I've been there myself and, you know, the, the number of things that I haven't done, um, for fear of failure or fear of looking bad. Um, you know, you always want to look good in this world. You always want to present yourself as you, you've got it all together. Um, you know, the, the truth is we, we all don't have it together all the time and that's okay. And, you know, being in community with, with others, um, whether you're an entrepreneur or whatever your, your lifestyle is, um, being around other people, uh, talking about these things, sharing successes, sharing failures, that's, that's what life is. You know, um, you talk about the entrepreneur life. Um, it, it's about trying and, and stepping out uh, from the crowd and being willing to take risks. And with risks, there are rewards. And there can potentially be failures, but as long as you keep pushing forward and you enjoy the process, um, then, then you're going to live a great life. You know, Paul Simon said, and I, I think Paul Simon is, is one of the greatest songwriters that's mm-hmm. ever lived. Without question. He said it took, it, it took him, you know, writing 200 bad songs before he wrote a good one. So when a young musician or a parent comes up to me and they said, my kid wants to be in the music industry, what's, what's your advice? I'm like, do it. Just, just do it. Start writing, start playing. What if your, if your first song is bad, that means you've only got 199 more bad ones to go before you write that great one. So <laughs> well, you might as well start now. When I know, became, when, when I became a it. professional speaker, I read an article in Speaker Magazine, which by the way is proof there are magazines for everybody. Uh, <laughs> and the interview was with a woman named, uh, Roxanne Emmerich and she is a legend. She, she does training in the banking industry and, uh, she's just a legend in my industry. And Roxanne said, look, you're going to have to give 300 professional level speeches. And I think, I mean, I read this 15 years ago, so I'm, I'm kind of, you know, bastardizing the exact statistics. But I think she said like a professional level speech was you had more than about 20 or 25 people in the audience and they invited you to be there. You weren't like speaking at your own company meeting where they're like, you know. Hey, Tom, stand up and, and tell us what you think about this, but where you were invited right. as a featured speaker. And I think she even said, doesn't matter if you're paid or not, but you are the featured speaker and people are listening to you for about an hour and you have to do 300 of them before you're ever going to be good. And along the way, you'll give good speeches and you'll have some, some accolades, but before you're going to be able to handle everything that can come your way as a professional speaker, you have to do 300. And at the time I'd read that, I'd done like 30 and I thought, oh my God, 300, that'll take a lifetime. Well, now I've done 800 or more professional level speeches and she was right. Somewhere around 300, something clicked and I was able to handle whatever came my way and and more companies started saying, oh, we'd like you. Same thing is true with this podcast. Somewhere around the 300th episode, I was able to go off script and just play with the guest 
And if you go back and listen to the, you know, the first 50 or 100 episodes, it's very mechanical. And then slowly I get to a point where I'm just able to have a conversation like we're sitting in a bar having a glass of wine. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally loving everything that you're saying. So, Well, I'm, I'm glad I, I got in, in, what are we, 456 or whatever today? So I'm, yeah. Four, I, 457. I'm glad I wasn't, yeah. in the first, I wasn't in the first 300. Yeah, that's right. It's a good um, thing we didn't meet four years ago or this episode oh, would yeah, this suck. Would, yeah, this would suck. Yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. So, Tom, I call the show Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. What's the coolest thing that you're doing with Austin City Limits right now? Oh, wow. Um, to me, the coolest thing that we're doing is, is something that was actually coined um, by Roy Spence, who is uh, a visionary at, at gsc and We had a meeting, and we were talking about the Austin City Limits archive, this 40-plus years of some of the greatest music that's ever been recorded. And due to rights issues... Um, it's, it's lived in a vault for the last 40 years. And Roy said, we've got to liberate the vault. And so what we're trying to do now is to clear the necessary rights with the publishing companies and the artists to make this amazing music available again to fans all around the world. And that is my, my big project for this year. And that's what our team is, is working on. And uh, I hope to be able to do that. We've been successful um, over the last few years with ACL Enterprises in clearing the rights and licensing um, a select number of, of Austin City Limits episodes. So we've had the best of Austin City Limits on MTV. And if you fly American Airlines now, you can see uh, older episodes of Austin City Limits, which is really fun for people to be able to see episodes that are no longer available on PBS. Um, but there's so much more uh, music that's been recorded um, over the years that we have not been able to to release to people. So that is my that is my goal. That's what's new and exciting is is liberating the vault for Austin City Women. <laughs> that's awesome. So Tom, you alluded to this a little while ago, and one of the things I love to ask people who come on to this show is I love to ask them what do they do to give back to the greater good. And, and you mentioned a, a foundation that you're a co-founder and, and, and chair of, and I really think it's important that people who are entrepreneurial and people who are fortunate, no matter what they're doing, and obviously you're very fortunate, you've lived an exciting life. I think people who have been fortunate, we have to find our way to give back. I, I have my way. We have a, an endowment to some research for kids born with cranial facial abnormalities because my youngest daughter had to have her skull rebuilt when she was an infant, and, and, that, and that was a horrible, horrible thing that our family had to go through. Now, she's now 17. She's a straight-A student. She's beautiful. We, we were very fortunate. And we Maybe. found we found our way to give back to people who might go through similar type things. But I love to ask the people who come on the show. So, what is it that you do to serve the greater good? And I'd love for you to talk about uh, the Hi, How Are You uh, program. Yeah. So the Hi, How Are You project started two years ago. Uh, myself and my girlfriend Courtney Blanton and I, um, you know, wanted to do something to to give back. And she was actually the one who came up with the idea uh, for the Hi, How Are You Project. The Hi, How Are You Project is, is named after a mural um, by an artist named Daniel Johnston. Um, on on Guadalupe, right across, right across from the university. Used to be a record store called Sound Exchange. And back in 1993, they paid Daniel Johnston 70 bucks to get up on the ladder. And, and they gave him free reign to, to paint the wall. And he painted, hi, how are you? And the Jeremiah, the innocent, or what, the friendly frog. And, you know, I've walked by that, that mural a thousand oh, times. Me too. And I've managed Daniel for the last 28 years. At the beginning of the interview, wasn't Daniel Johnson one of the, the musicians you said that impressed you early on with the music industry in Austin? He, he was. And, and that show, IRS is the Cutting Edge, that I watched in 1985 or, or whenever it was on. And inspired me to come to Austin. And, and now here we sit today. Um, and I've managed Daniel Johnson for the last 28 years. And I run Austin City Limits, which was also one of the beacons that that drew me to it's, Austin. It's so, interesting how things go full circle, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. And when you are blessed in that way, and you talk about how can you give back, you know, that that mural 
um, has been speaking to us in, in Austin as, as a really friendly city. And Courtney said, that's a, it's the perfect conversation starter. Four little words, hi, how are you, that we can ask a friend, a loved one, a coworker. But the key is not just to say it. You know, we all say, hey, how you doing? It's about meaning it. And it's about engaging in a deeper level of conversation. And, you know, to kind of tie this back into being an entrepreneur, um, when you are in, in the office, if you're in a meeting, if you're at a lunch, when you are with somebody in, in business, whether they work for you or, or they're a client or whatever it might be, try to be present with that person in, in a deeper, more human way. You know, you, you talk about giving a speech and somewhere along the, the line of, of 300, it went from being, um, you know, clinical to more human and more natural. If, if we can be more comfortable around one another, especially more comfortable uh, talking about the things that aren't perfect. Social media, um, unfortunately, allows all of us to be very selective in what we present to the world. It's, it's, uh, I've heard, it's, I've heard it's friends like a refer to it as fake, fake book. Well, it's like, it's like the Christmas letter, right? I think, I think social media is just a Christmas letter all year long because nobody ever writes in the Christmas letter that their son went to prison. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and so what we encourage with the Hi, How Are You project is for people to be open in conversation. Um, it, it can be very helpful. I have heard from small businesses that say, uh, we were so inspired by, by what y'all are doing. Every Friday morning, we have a hi, how are you meeting? And it is the, the purpose of this meeting is we sit around the, the conference room and we talk and we say, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? What are you dealing with right now? How can we support you? I would love for other small businesses to take that on. We've heard of businesses that are, are starting a hi, how are you lounge, which is kind of a meditation room um, or a quiet space where someone can just take a mental health break and go take 30 minutes to be quiet and to be with their thoughts and to just kind of refresh and recharge and then come back to your desk and be really productive. So you can go to org to learn more. Um, we create uh, events, uh, our big one being Hi How Are You Day, which is every year January 22nd. Uh, which is Daniel Johnson's birthday, and we do a global live streaming concert. This year here in Austin, we had the Flaming Lips and Built to Spill, Yola Tango, Bob Mool, Black Angel, Bob Schneider, and, and many more performing. And people could watch it um, on three different networks, live streamed for free. You could be with us at ACL Live at the Moody Theater in person. Um, so this is what we do to, to give back. And... Um, it is something that is very important to the entrepreneur um, community. We have been in conversations with the, uh, the EO organization here in Austin about coming to speak with their team. And um, we're just really excited about the, the feedback that we've received over the last 18 months. Again, going back to, you know, be passionate about something and fail fast. We bid off way more than we could chew <laughs> in taking this thing on. And, but we just jumped in with both feet and we said, it's something we're passionate about. It's something that Courtney and I get to do together, which, which I love. But we um, are, are not experts in starting a nonprofit, even though um, I work for one in, at, at KLRU in Austin City Limits. It was a huge growth curve. Um, there were sleepless nights, um, truly blood, sweat, and tears. But you, you do it because you love it and you jump in and then the, the community lifts you up and, and you're just amazed by what comes back to you when, when you do these, these sorts of things. Well, I'm, I'm a, a little like tear struck here because I love the message of what you're talking about. One of the things that I was really moved by two years ago, which is weird because it's probably about the same time, there was an article in the Harvard Business Journal by Vivek Murthy, and I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He was the Surgeon General under President Obama, and he wrote an article yeah. called The Epidemic of Loneliness. 
And I've been speaking about how do you connect better with people in a social media crazy world? I've been speaking about networking and really connecting for 15 years. And his article really struck me because we live in a world where, you know, most of my competition as speakers around this whole concept of networking and connecting for the past decade or more have been people who are like, oh, it's likes, links, shares, and follows. Click your way to a better life. And his article basically said, we live in a world where we are more connected than ever and that people are lonelier than they've ever been. All the generations, people feel more isolated. So after 10 or 15 years of having all these social media tools, we're not feeling seen. And I talk about, I have a slide in my presentation uh, that I do when I do the, the networking and connecting presentation, and it's just hashtag see people. And I don't own that hashtag. I didn't invent that hashtag but I use it once in a while on, on Twitter and on Instagram because when you're with people, you got to choose people. You got to, you got to take a moment to put the electronics down and look someone in the eye. And I would now add, say, hi, how are you? Please. It, it, it's really simple, but it's, it's really powerful. And, uh, you know, I had, uh, a real privilege of, of being invited to a C-SPAN conversation with uh, Dr. Merte and, and, you know, I had uh, a minute of, uh, of the hour, but I got to listen in on just how, how brilliant he is and, um, and about the significance of the loneliness epidemic and, and what it means to our health. And if folks who are listening are entrepreneurs and, and business leaders, um, making sure that those within your organization um, are invited into the community of your organization and that you're, you're really listening and you're being with those people. Um, it's not only just a good thing to do as a human being, um, it's a good thing to do as an entrepreneur because a, a happier, healthier workforce is clearly going to be more productive. I could list off uh, a mile long of, statistics on what we lose um, as, as a productive society due to lost hours and lost productivity due to mental health issues. It is a $16 trillion problem over the next 15 years. So all the people listening who are entrepreneurs and who are starting businesses, we can be a part of the solution in making sure that just you know, within your own home, within your own business, that people are talking and, and, you know, doing the right things for, for their mental health. And it's not just talking, it's exercise and diet and all the things that we know about getting adequate sunlight, mindfulness, all of these things. They're very simple. Um, I think they should be supported in all businesses um, because it's, it's not only the right thing to do, it's a profitable thing to do. Well, and sometimes the thing we forget, and I, I by no means have any background or expertise in this, but one of the things we forget is when we think about these type of issues, it's not just the people who have serious depression issues. I talked to a woman one time who was a researcher, and she was doing research on something called hidden sadness. And she said that it really it's, hits a lot in middle-aged men, and that is nobody knows that they're struggling. And oftentimes it's the extrovert in your office who feels invisible. And you think, well, he can't be sad. He's the life of the party. And so it's not just people who even show the signs that we might see on television commercials. But sometimes it's, you know, you're at a conference and, you know, it's, it's the guy who's the life of the party is, is feeling nobody sees him or her. And so you know, these are things we have to do. So I'm, I'm very taken with, with, your, with your message because it ties into this whole idea that I talk about, about choose people and, and, and making sure that when you're with people, you actually see them. Because I think that's important, and I think that we've gotten away from it in the last decade. And I think that, uh, you know, I, raising teenagers and people in their early 20s, I think that, you know, lots of times they're in their room on their phone, you know, typing with their friends, but it's not the same as, as sitting face-to-face. -face. It is not. It is, it is not. And we need to get more connected. We need to uh, encourage young people, uh, especially um, because they've grown up with, with these phones and, and the computer computers and the, the iPads and, and the video games, and they are designed to be addictive. Um, it is, it's easy for us as a parent to say, put that down, but it's, it's a challenge because, um, you know, those things really draw you in and uh, the folks who, who create those devices know what they're doing. 
Facebook knows what they're doing to, to draw you in. So we just need not, not to vilify any of those things. They're, they're tremendous tools right. and they're, they're wonderful technology. And we should continue to, to create um, in those fields. We just need to have some common sense and some balance to get outside, um, to be with one another as human beings, um, and to truly connect when we do have those opportunities. We, we all live in a pretty fast-paced world right now. And so, you know, we're not sitting around the campfire every night like, uh, like we <laughs> used to uh, a thousand years ago. So in those moments where we do grab a coffee, where we do see somebody in the hallway or we do have a lunch, um, really be there. Be yeah. present and, and, and be with one another uh, in a genuine way. And one of the best ways to do that is to reveal something about yourself. Um, uh, Courtney has been an inspiration in, in this and she stepped up and spoke very openly about the, the mental health issues that, that she dealt with specifically depression. And when she opens up, it's amazing how the room opens up. So if you do want to, uh, find out how that quiet person in your, your office or, or maybe someone who you might be a little bit concerned about, if you want to open them up open up first yourself and talk about something that you're dealing with. And all of us, everybody listening has had some experience with anxiety or depression or sadness or loneliness or, or whatever it might be. And so by opening up and saying, this is what I've gone through. How are you doing? It, it creates a safe space and an opening for that person to say, well, you know, now that you've mentioned it, um, I can't tell you how many times in, in meetings I've been in for, for Hi, How Are You with Courtney when she shared her story and someone has been moved to tears or someone has opened up and said, well, I, I haven't told anybody this, but I lost my mother to suicide when I was a teenager and I've never spoken about that. But this is something that I've experienced in my own life or they'll talk about their wife or a, a parent or a child that is dealing with something. It affects all of us. So if we just create the safe space to share, uh, you know, what we're going through as human beings, um, it really makes it much easier for people to open up. Well, Tom, I know that this conversation, especially this last 10 minutes, has probably resonated pretty strongly uh, with somebody listening. So if somebody wants to find out how they can get involved, how they can learn from or volunteer or donate to the Hi, How Are You Project, how do, how do they do that again? What's the URL? It's org, and you can shoot me an email at tom at org, or just go to the website and, um, and, and learn more. And there's, there's plenty of links where, where you can get involved. Um, you can share on social media and you can hashtag uh, hi, how are you? Wow. Well, I got to tell you, I am so glad that you reached out to me on LinkedIn. I think this is one of the most powerful episodes of the show we've had in a long time. And I am pretty sure that this is going to be one of those episodes where I get texts and emails and comments on on uh, social media about, wow, thank you for, for bringing Tom Gimbel to the little community here at Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. So thank you for coming on and, and sharing your journey and telling us uh, some tips from the music industry that translates to all entrepreneurships. Uh, entrepreneurs, and then also uh, sharing a little bit about the Hi, How Are You project. That, that was awesome. Tom, thanks for being a guest. Absolutely. My pleasure. And we will need to, to find time since we're both in Austin to, uh, to have that beer. I am, I am all for that. And thank you to everybody who tuned in and listened. I say it every single show. If it wasn't for the audience, why would we do this? It's all about you. So I hope that you enjoyed this one. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about getting out there and trying something new. You can always go buy a t-shirt at trynewthings.shop. That's trynewthings.shop. Go and buy one of those t-shirts. Uh, one of my friends laughed because the other day I said, look, I'm having to pay for my daughter's wedding. Go buy a shirt. And I got a text from a friend saying, now there's a way to fund the wedding. And I said, well, you know, that's where the money will go because that's where all the money goes. Um, so uh, we're going to be back in a couple of days with some more episodes, more interviews with people just as cool as Tom Gimbel. I know you're thinking, how is that possible? But we always seem to do it. Uh, but in the meantime, go out there and try something new. And while you're at it, have a great day. Thank you for being part of the Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do podcast. Without your participation and listening to these conversations, there is no show. Connect with Tom at TomSinger.com and follow him on Twitter at, at TomSinger.com.